Welcome back. This hour, we are bringing you the face-chewing murder trial for Austin Harif. Prosecutors claim the former college student randomly killed a couple in their garage six years ago. And then when police arrived, they found him on top of one of the victims chewing on his face. That victim, a man by the name of John Stevens. Right now, we've been watching uh, what we thought was going to start with uh, opening statements in a bench trial to determine the sanity of Austin Harif. And out of the gate, both sides told the judge that they have stipulated that at the time of the incident, indeed, the defendant was um, insane and that he should be found not guilty by reason of insanity and be committed uh, to the proper institution rather than move forward. At the end of the day, the, it's up to the judge. Uh, so let's go back in uh, to court and listen to the, his honor. Uh, not, not for this part, the family would like to say something to you. I assume that. Uh, defense for, with this part, with the uh, judge of the defendant not guilty? Anything further? No, sir. All right. Uh, would the families like to speak first? Uh, yes. <laughs> Good morning, ma'am. Can I look at the defendant, or I have to look this way? You can, you can look over there if you'd like, yes. Can I turn this? Yeah. If you'd like to. Um, if you could go ahead and just state your name. Yeah, I'm going to. And please bear with me, because I have a lot to say. Okay. A lot. For those of you that don't know me, my name is Cindy Mishkan. I am Michelle Mishkan's sister. You can't even look at me. Ma'am, you... ma'am. Oh, to wow, know. okay. I am Michelle Mishkan's sister and John Stevens' sister-in-law. I started writing my victim, victim's impact statement a long time ago at a time when I was naive enough to think that there would actually be justice, at a minimum, a trial, and at a time when I thought you might actually care to hear how you destroyed my life and the lives of my family members. In my statement, I told you all about my sister, Michelle, about her amazing blue eyes, about how she, went, about how she too went to Florida State, about how we were only 16 months apart and best friends, about how she used to rub my stomach for hours when I was debilitated by terrible stomach aches as a child, and how I bought a house in Jupiter so we could grow old together, sitting on my patio watching the boats go by. Those are just some of the things I was going to tell you about my amazing sister. But that was then, and this is now. Everything changed for me a long time ago just as the ink dried on my heartfelt victim's impact statement. Everything changed, not because I miraculously recovered from the excruciating emotional pain you caused me, but because I started listening to your jailhouse calls and quickly realized that you were intent on causing me and my family even more unbearable pain. I quickly realized from listening to those calls that you don't care about how your actions have affected me, you don't care about how your actions have affected my family. You don't care that you murdered my parents' firstborn child. You don't care that you, you don't care about anyone but yourself. In fact, the only victim that you and your family see in all of this is you and the Haroff name. So what exactly did you and your family say on the jailhouse calls that led me to this conclusion? Well, for starters, your parents repeatedly told you over and over ad nauseum, that you did nothing wrong, that you have nothing to be sorry for, that you are a good boy. It's then a toss-up for me between two statements that were the hardest for me to hear and made me realize that you just don't care. I have a question. If I'm quoting, am I allowed to use a swear word? I'm going to repeat that then. It sent a toss-up for me between two statements that were the hardest for me to hear and made me realize that you just don't care. The first was having to hear your father refer to Michelle.
how he celebrated and took the entire office out for drinks the day the day the FBI lab report came back. It didn't matter to your father that you stabbed Michelle multiple times in the back, neck, and face. That you fractured Michelle's nose, arm, and ribs, or that you knocked out her teeth. No, none of that mattered. All that mattered to you and your father was that the lab report is what the lab report meant for you and your high price fabricated defense and how you could use the report to bolster the illusion or delusion that you are the victim. So what else did I hear on the jailhouse calls that made me quickly realize that you thought of yourself as the only victim in all of this? Well, in one call, you liken yourself to a POW. In another call, you liken yourself to a Holocaust survivor. And in another call, you liken yourself to an African which I believe you're referring to a slave. Is it really so hard for you to understand that you are just a cold-blooded murderer, not a victim, and certainly not a POW, Holocaust survivor or slave? Like how insulting can you be to the real victims? You are disgusting. And how terrible it has real and how terrible has it really been for you while waiting for your day in court? Well, when I was still listening to the jailhouse calls, you were fed three meals a day. You had your magazine and newspaper subscriptions delivered to you. You had your own toilet, your own shower, and for good measure, your own personal phone to use all day long, which you did. You also had a new girlfriend, and let's not forget that you had your weekly care packages from mommy. Listening to you refer to yourself as a POW, a Holocaust survivor, and a slave reminded me of the game on Sesame Street. One of these things is not like the other. So after listening... Okay your team is going to walk out of this courtroom and proclaim victory, that you've been fully vindicated and that you are truly the victim in all of this. And I couldn't live with myself if I didn't let the world know exactly who you really are in your own words. Because not only did I spend hundreds of hours listening to your jailhouse calls, but I also spent countless nights going through your text messages and notes on your cell phone. So this is who you are, Austin Haroff, in mostly your own words, and in a few instances, the words of your family members and friends, whose names I'll leave out. And again, I apologize, this is going to take a while. Apologize. I'm starting on your phone about one year prior to the day you murdered Michelle and John. August 22nd, 2015. I drove high for the first time, smoked a friend's brother's bong. August 29th, you got kicked out of a frat party. August 30th, we're going to smoke now. September 11th, and these are all just different texts. in your mouth. September 14th, you talked about easy access to drugs due to joining a fraternity. September 9th, I was trashed. I'm going to drink my troubles away. September 22nd, I'm living life in the fast lane. September 25th, I was heavy once into drugs. September 27th, you hooked up with somebody because, quote, I was really drunk. Quote, I'm a douche. Kill me with a knife. To that I say, I wish I could. Quote, I just drank a fifth of vodka. Dare me to drive. October I 
totally blacked out. I blacked out last night. I blacked out last night for the first time. Then you said you wanted to do roids to make your legs big. You then said we went to some trailer park and did meth. Drunk. I was so drunk I couldn't even function. October 12th. You didn't know I'm a psychopath? October 14th. I'm actually drunk right now. October. Blackout till you can't see anymore. Blackout till you fly. Sick. I did meth in some trailer park. October 17th, I'm drunk, give me the keys. I want to get... ...easy last night, to which you said, I remember nothing. Sounds familiar. Then there's a photo of you passed out next to your toilet, next to a toilet with your pants down and vomit in the toilet. You said, apparently this happened. remember anything. October 23rd, on my third blackout, it's four and I'm drunk. I'm trying so hard not to blackout. October 24th, I'm already drunk. October 25th, you had a, oh, yeah, you had a friend with, a conversation with a friend regarding whether to try Vivans. Remember those Vivans? You asked your friend to bring you a pill. October 26th, I took Vivans. I drank like three energy drinks. My friend gave me a Vivans October 28th. I blocked out, lost my hat, my tennis shoes, and my muscle shirt. Snapped. I don't know how I even got home. Bro, when I start drinking, I can't stop. I ran into a friend, and he showed me a pic of me, passed out. SD. October 29th, I wish I wasn't so wasted. October 30th, I'm always high. October 31st, I... November 9th. You sold one of your Vivans to a friend. November 10th, crash from Vivans. I'm getting hammered tomorrow. Want shrooms. November 12th, trashed on shroom. November 13th, I need to smoke. November 14th, I want to get there before the all, uh, I'm sorry. I want to get there before, before all the sluts drink the alcohol. Want to get hammered. Me and a friend are, ha are hammered at Fresh. Someone Michelle Michon's sister um, delivering a very emotional impact statement. A uh, lot of swear words in there. That's why the audio goes out as we cannot uh, broadcast those for obvious re reasons. We'll get a commercial break in here and then we'll go back into the courtroom. The headline, though, is that both sides agree that the defendant, in this case, Austin Harif, should be found not guilty by reason of insanity. Back after this. Two. back. We've been bringing you uh, the Austin Harif trial of case going on in Florida. The judge has just accepted a not guilty by reason of insanity um, conclusion, basically. This, both sides showed up today and we were expecting opening statements in a bench trial to determine whether or not Austin Harif would be found not guilty by reason of insanity or, or not. And it was going to be up to the judge. Well, the prosecution and the defense both started today by saying we agree. At the time of the murders, he was insane. Back in 2016, he stabbed 
a couple he did not know to death. And when investigators arrived, police arrived on the scene, he was actually chewing on uh, one of the individuals, John Stevens. Right now, we're listening to victim impact statements. This is the sister of Michelle Mission. She, Michonne, she was the other victim in this case. And this woman is angry uh, at the behavior of the defendant leading up to the murders, basically going through his text messages and reading them aloud in court. Let's go back in last night and didn't block happy january 22nd i party harder than you well me and my friend are about to start drinking i was just extremely hung over and tired this morning hey it's cool if i bring a girl back she has a prescription plus she's rich as hell Just don't know what happened. Hardly remember anything. Remember them asking if I was blacked out. Your friend asked, why is a dude sucking your toe? You said, I January 26th, need codeine. Need to smoke, need a friend to smoke in the shower with me. January 29th, what's that Addy does? Drunk, waste. Off a couple hits. Apparently, I walked out of the club randomly, didn't know where I was. All right, uh, this is a bit ridiculous in, in that we can't really share this with you because she's recounting the texts made, and they're full of swear words, and so they're getting um, bleeped out, basically. So, while she continues with the text, um, we, we're watching. As soon as she's done reading these texts full of swear words, we'll go right back in. But Jamie White and Marie Pereira are, are with us. And uh, Jamie, I cut you off earlier. Um, your thoughts over all of this? Uh, bench trial about to begin, and both sides say, eh, uh, this, this should conclude with him going to an institution, not prison. I'm really fascinated, Ted, um, especially in light of the victim's sister. The testimony she's providing right now certainly suggests that this young man um, consistently is under the influence. And when it comes to an insanity defense, intoxication um, cannot create the insanity, right? I mean, you can't uh, create your own insanity by being intoxicated, whether it's drugs and or alcohol. So having not read the report, not heard all the proofs, um, I just, I'm fascinated that the state um, stipulated to this, presuming their doctor came to the same conclusion. Otherwise, um, I'm, I'm really shocked that uh, the state went along with this. And I, we'll see what the judge does. He's not bound by this order. Um, he certainly could hear proofs and make a decision contrary to what the attorneys have decided. Yeah, and, and maybe she will uh, success, successfully argue it. Marie, your thoughts on the, the, this victim impact statement is more of a case against the defendant. She has done her homework. She's listened to the jail calls, gone through, every, it sounds like, all the discovery here. Uh, it's quite extraordinary, as, as Jamie said. What are your overall thoughts of what we're watching? I'm shocked, to be very honest, I agree with Jamie. I've never seen something like this and I was expecting a trial. The fact that they stipulated that he was insane, mentally incapable due to psychiatric disease of understanding what he did was wrong and knowing all the facts now that his sister is providing of uh, something he did of his own free will, basically becoming a drug addict and uh, an alcoholic, causing him to act this way, and then saying, okay, I was insane. I totally agree with Jamie, and I don't know why the prosecution would agree to something like this, but they had to assess the case in its entirety and figure it out with the family's approval, I'm sure, because how did she even get a hold of these jail calls that it was okay to end the case this way but this is sh shocking to me yeah and again we'll, we'll go right back in as, as soon as she's done reading those text messages because the text messages are um, every other word is a swear word so um it, it's pointless just to have um it, it go on jamie the uh, the judge has not made a 
uh, a final ruling here. It's in his hands, but he sure seemed open to, all right, this is the way you guys want to go. I, I'm willing to go that route. Uh, do you think there is a, a chance that he might not? I, you know, I think it's unlikely. Um, it certainly would arguably set up an appeal um, on the part of the defendant. Um, you know, part of the problem here is because of the plea, uh, there has not been any evidence presented to the court. You know, one thing that viewers should understand is the court does not have police reports. The court does not get anything provided to them prior to a trial. They learn the evidence just as if a jury were to learn the evidence. So the idea that the judge is going to have enough information to um, basically conclude that the plea is not in the interest of justice um, is unlikely. You know, I, I suspect that um, it, it, this will go forward. The state, Marie, likely, I mean, they wouldn't enter into this stipulation unless they knew they were going to lose, you know, that, that they couldn't in, in good faith argue something that they knew they didn't have. Uh, to Jamie's point, probably their expert did, agreed with the defense, right? They, they didn't have the ammunition to go forward, even though we seem to hear some ammunition coming out of the mouth uh, in a victim impact statement uh, from the sister. I can promise you that the state didn't come to this decision without conferring with their experts and the family. And I think that this is something that they came to realize we're not going to take this to trial. They discussed it with the family and that's what they're doing. They had to have some holes in their case. And it could be a situation too where they want to spare the family the pain from going through all the details that are extremely painful to this day. You can tell by the victim impact statement. And they decided to just not put the family through that. But it was a, a decision, I'm sure, that didn't come lightly. And they had to have the stamp of approval from the family. I'm sure of that. Mm, I don't know if they got the stamp of approval from this woman who's addressing the court right now. She did make a statement saying that she's disgusted by the process and she wasn't going to get justice. Uh, we'll do this. We'll get a break as she continues to read into the record the text messages from the defendant talking about his drug use, etc. And we'll get you back into the courtroom right after this. In 2018, a killer walked the streets of Laredo, Texas. He took advantage of the vulnerability of this community. I mean, there is a lot of fear. Former Border Patrol agent Juan David Ortiz. Accused of killing four women. Ortiz carried out these murders in a cold in callous way. Now, he faces a jury and life in prison if convicted. The Border Patrol Serial Killer Trial. Live coverage today on Court TV. Right now. Back, we began the day believing that we were going to be watching the beginning of a bench trial for Austin Harif. He was a, in 2016, a college student at Florida State University. And he ended up murdering two people, Michelle Michon and John Stevens. He did not know the victims. When a police arrived, he was on top of John Stevens after he had stabbed and beaten the two to death and he was chewing on the cheek of John Stevens. Early this morning, uh, just as soon as the uh, judge took the bench, both sides got up and said that, hey, we've come to a stipulation, Your Honor, that we agree that at the time of these murders, the defendant was insane. Therefore, we believe he should be found not guilty by reason of insanity, meaning the trial stops right here. Now, the judge has not completely uh, accepted this this is not com this is not over um, yet it likely will be as soon as the victim impact statements uh, conclude right now we're listening to the sister of Michelle Michon and uh, she's going through the text messages that she has researched coming from the phone of the defendant and there are a lot of swear words in there so we've been sort of breaking away going back in and breaking away um, why don't we do this let's go back in listen to it see how it goes if there are a lot of swear words we'll have to you know come out because we um, we can't show, uh, you know have those obviously but let's let's see where it goes and uh, and we'll see where where this all ends and see if the judge rubber stamps this not guilty by reason of insanity August 8th, seven days before the murders. You text a friend about smoking after dinner. You also discuss buying more drugs, specifically nine edibles. The same day, you do a Google search. How to know if you're going crazy. 
From that, you link to a site called What Am I Crazy Really Means. And what it said, if you bother to read it, what it says is, if you did this search, then it generally means you are not crazy. Because crazy people don't know they're crazy. August 9th, six days before the murders, you made a mur uh, an arrangement to purchase mushrooms. You said, I don't need any more weed, but the shrooms are good. The drug dealer said, yeah, they're golden teacher, properly dried and cured. You asked, quote, how much would it take me to trip, but not too bad? The drug dealer said 1.5 to 2 grams. Two grams gives my friend solid, materialized visuals and put him close to the edge of uncomfortable. You then agree to buy 1.5 grams. You then ask a friend, can you send me an Addy? And a different friend asks you, Why did, what did you guys do? You texted your girlfriend. I realized that even though I wasn't doing drugs all the time, I was still a drug addict. Those are your words. You then texted someone referring to Vivans. I guess I realized I don't need them. And I'm quoting again. I thought I was crazy, but I'm really not. Again, your words. August 11th, four days before the murders. You texted a friend. Quote, I just know that for me, personally, the drugs are taking a toll on me. And I can't handle your words. The drugs were taking a toll on you. August 12th, three days before the murders, you texted, quote, I don't think I'm going crazy, end quote. You talked about how the drugs changed you. The drugs changed you. The drugs. August 13th, two days before the murders, you again, you talked about how the drugs were hurting you. The drugs. You said, quote, the drugs made me vulnerable to evil, end quote. On August 14th, 2016, one day before the murders, you purchased a knife at the gun show. You were with your father, who claimed after the murders that you were well on your way to crazy by then. So wait, <laughs> he let you buy a knife when he thought you were crazy? It's just not believable. Not believable. And then just two and a half hours after purchasing that knife, you know what you did? Do you remember the Google search you did? Two and a half hours after purchasing a knife. You did a search about the Thanksgiving massacre when someone killed four of their family members and pled insanity as a defense. Sounds like somebody plotting a murder to me. The same day before the murders, you wrote in your notes, quote, I can't be tamed. I can do whatever I want. Just know it has consequences. I was called the silent killer for a reason. I can be a good actor. Then the night before the murders, you had a perfectly normal Perfectly normal late night conversation with your girlfriend. Nothing crazy about it. And now we arrive to August 15th, the day of the murders. Another totally normal conversation with your girlfriend. Your sister, who's apparently claimed to be terrified of you and locked her doors at night, texts you to pick her up so she can go to the beach with you doesn't make sense. You texted your mom, nice guys finish last. Like to know what that means. Your dad asked you on the afternoon before you killed my sister, did you throw the drugs out? Did you throw the drugs out? You didn't answer yes. You know what you said to him? <coughs> Learn. What does that mean? 
Are you ever going to tell us what that means? And then you had another totally normal conversation with your girlfriend. And what I found really enlightening was the comments of your friends on your text messages after you killed my sister. These are their words. I won't use their names. Something he did do, Flocka. Dude, he wasn't a psycho. It was the drugs. He's famous now, LOL. He got what he wanted. His friends probably got Coke or Molly that was laced. So I asked myself, why are we here today? Why is there no trial? Why is my family being denied justice? I'm not a criminal lawyer, but I have been a practicing attorney in South Florida for over 30 years. And I have read the insanity statute. It's actually very basic. It starts with the following words, quote, all persons are presumed to be sane. All persons are presumed to be sane. And the statute ends with, the defendant has the burden of proving the defense of insanity by clear and convincing evidence. The defendant uh, has Michelle Michon uh, is an attorney that explains uh, her grasp of it all. One of